Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. My name is Katie B. My pronouns are she, her, and today I will be your moderator for our presentation. So that means I'm going to be keeping an eye out for your questions and comments or hypotheses down at the bottom of the screen. If you're joining us from Facebook or YouTube, thank you so much, but I'm so sorry, we can't actually look at your questions or comments at this time. So next time, register ahead on Zoom, and you can head to the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to type your questions to us there. If you'd like to see closed captioning, there is also a button at the bottom of the screen that says CC. So at this point, I invite our educators to turn on their cameras and say hello. Hi everybody, my name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and today I will be uh, your guide as we talk about a whole bunch of stuff in space, but I cannot do it alone. Hello everybody, my name is Talia. I also use she, her pronouns, and I am going to be your pilot today. Awesome. So uh, to start us off, um, I'm just going to uh, show you the Hubble Space Telescope website before we dive into Talia's wonderful visuals that she's prepared for us. Um, because today we're going to be talking about limits and boundaries in space. So things like how big can stars get? Um, how big can planets get? Uh, what's the difference between a planet and a star? Um, and you know things like how big does a star need to be in order to turn into a black hole and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and a lot of it is rooted in mathematics. It's kind of done on paper to figure out like you know the theoretical largest star possible. But then we also need our observational evidence to confirm um, you know the math behind it. So NASA's four great observatories consist of the Hubble Space Telescope. Um, as well as the Chandra X-ray Observatory, the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory, and the Spitzer Space Telescope. Um, all of these telescopes basically look at the universe in different kinds of light. And each one has their own specialty of which type of light that they're looking at. So one might be looking at really high energy light like X-rays, while the Hubble uh, tends to look mostly in visible light. So all of these telescopes together have provided this wonderful image essentially of our universe and they can use the light from various objects from things within our own solar system to things in galaxies billions of light years away to give us an idea of you know how what things are made of and the age of the universe and how how much it's expanding and just things like that so i wanted to just highlight the hubble space telescope website before we dive in um, you'll probably recognize a lot of the the things in here if you decide to go in and click on the news images videos and things like that um, that I'll be talking about later on in this program. Hubble specifically has given us some insight into formations of stars and nebulas in general in our own galaxy um, that has been absolutely essential to, you know, putting the puzzle pieces of our universe together. Um, all right, so I'm going to stop sharing now and we can turn on over to Talia's, uh, Talia's image here. So she's using a program called Worldwide Telescope, which simulates the universe. Um, we're right now looking at our solar system because I figured we would start close to home, start with the smaller end of things. And eventually, by the end of the program, we'll be talking about, you know, some of the most massive things in the universe. So the first place that we can start is how big does an object need to be in order to be round? So the more mass an object has, the more gravity it has as well. And once you get to a certain point, gravity will pull an object into a fairly spherical shape as long as it has enough mass. And if there's an object that's made of rock, for example, it needs to be a roughly 400 miles across in order for it to be a round object. So when we look at objects in the asteroid belt, for example, most of those objects are shaped like lumpy potatoes because they're pretty small compared to other objects in space. So Talia has highlighted the asteroid belt for us there in red. 
There are millions of these asteroids in this area in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter, but there are a few asteroids that reach this limit and are able to be round. Ceres is one that comes to mind. It is technically considered a dwarf planet, so it's not, you know, one of the eight planets of the solar system, but it is round and it orbits the sun. And it's also classified as an asteroid. Now, Ceres is around 600 miles across. Um, so it definitely meets that limit, but it's on the lower end of things. And uh, there's another object in the asteroid belt called Vesta that is about 300 miles across that doesn't quite match that limit. So it's kind of, it's definitely got that potato shape um, going on there. So that's the lower end of things um, and how massive something needs to be in order to be round. But now let's talk about planets. So the largest planet in our solar system is Jupiter. So let's take a quick fly over to Jupiter and talk about how big it is. So Jupiter is enormous compared to the other planets in our solar system. If you could open it up like a cookie jar and try to fill it with Earths, you could fit over 1,300 Earths inside of Jupiter. Um, so it is absolutely massive. It's got a very strong gravitational force. That's why it can hang on to so many moons around it. But is Jupiter the biggest planet in the galaxy? Well, the answer to that is no, planets can actually be bigger than Jupiter, but they can't be too big. Otherwise, they might turn into a star. So the largest that a planet can get is roughly anywhere from, well, it's about 13 times the mass of Jupiter. Um, so mass, it, we're going to be talking about it a lot in this program. Mass is the amount of stuff that something is made up of, whereas size is how much space something takes up. So we'll be talking about both of those things, but there is a difference. Um, so 13 times the mass of Jupiter is the upper limit of what a plan as of how big a planet can be. What happens when you start getting bigger than that is that fusion starts happening in the core. So the difference kind of at the, I already said core, but at the core, the difference between a planet and a star is the ability to uh, make energy essentially, or to give off energy, to have a fuel source, which is nuclear fusion. So planets don't have their own energy source, stars do. So once a planet gets too big, um, or 13 times the mass of Jupiter, uh, pressures and temperatures inside the core of that object get high enough that fusion can start happening, um, which releases energy. Now, if you get to be 13 times the mass of Jupiter, um, but you know, you kind of stay at that area, you become this object that's kind of in between a planet and a star where fusion happens, but it's not the type of fusion that happens in a full-blown star. And so these kind of in-between objects, sometimes they're called failed stars, but the most common name for them is a brown dwarf. So in this graphic, we can see planets and exoplanets over on the left side, again, up to 13 times Jupiter's mass. And then you have these middle objects, the brown dwarfs that are anywhere from 13 times Jupiter's mass up to 80 times. Anything bigger than that, then you start to get consistent fusion of hydrogen in the core, which is what defines a star. And so anything over 80 times Jupiter's mass is a star with fusion happening at the core. So stars then have their own kind of lower and upper limits as well. So let's go back to um, Worldwide Telescope and head into interstellar space because stars, uh, they've got a wide range of sizes and our sun is a fairly average star. So it's right in the middle. Um, it's a main sequence star, which just means it's kind of in the middle of its life. It's four and a half billion years old and it's got another four and a half billion years to go. So it'll be hanging around for quite a bit longer. Um, 
And yeah, it's just an average star. So there's a lot that can be smaller and a lot that can be bigger. But let's start kind of from the um, beginning, right? When stars are actually forming. They form in these giant clouds of gas and dust called nebulas. And uh, this particular nebula that you're looking at is an animation um, made by someone at the, at the Charles Hayden Planetarium. And in these clouds, they're, they're called molecular clouds, clumps of material start to kind of form together. So over time, uh, the clump will attract more and more material and eventually collapse in on itself, causing pressures and temperatures in the core to skyrocket, starting that fusion process and creating a baby star. Now, these molecular clouds have to be a certain mass in order to start forming stars. Um, this critical mass is called the genes mass. It's kind of like your pants, genes, like G-E-A-N-S. Um, the genes mass is how massive a cloud can be before it starts to become unstable. And these little pockets of, of um, dense kind of gas and dust collapse into stars. So the genes mass is different depending on what these clouds are made of and how much space they take up, but that is kind of the general um, limit, upper limit of these molecular clouds. Now, before I go on to talk about the smallest stars and the biggest stars, have any questions come in so far? Hi, Katie. We have uh, a question about maybe some of the elements involved. So carbon 12, nitrogen 13, question mark. Oh, interesting. Um, I know that most molecular clouds are primarily composed of hydrogen and helium. Same with stars. And through the fusion process, other elements form. So you've got hydrogen um, combining fusing to form helium and then helium in the the very kind of central part of the core will then fuse to form heav heavier elements like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen not exactly sure about what specific um, isotopes <laughs> of each of those elements are involved um, but most of these clouds are are hydrogen and some helium as well all right, so uh, that is how a little bit of how stars form. Now let's kind of talk about the range of sizes of stars. So we, on the lower end of things, we have a classification of stars called a red dwarf. So in this graphic here, um, the first and second panels are comparing the sizes of planets in our solar system. Um, so you see Mercury is the smallest there and Jupiter is the largest. Then in pane three, you can see Jupiter's really, really tiny over on the left. And that's compared to Wolf 359, which is the smallest or one of the smallest known stars, um, which is a red dwarf. It's categorized as a red dwarf. These stars burn through their fuel very slowly, so they can live for a very long time without running out of fuel. Um, they can live for trillions of years. So technically, astronomers have never seen a red dwarf actually die because the universe hasn't been around long enough to observe a small, a low mass star actually run out of fuel. Um, so that's kind of the lower limit of things. And then you can see the sun compared to uh, Wolf 359, that red dwarf there. And then the sun compared to um, some other stars, like Sirius is a much larger star than the sun. And it just goes up and up and up and up all the way to V.Y. Canis Majoris, which is one of the largest known stars in the universe. Um, there are some estimates on the theoretical largest star that could potentially ever exist, um, and it's somewhere on the order of 150 times the mass of our sun, which is incredibly massive. 
There have been observations from telescopes of stars that could even be bigger than that. Hubble specifically has uh, captured images of a star in a nearby galaxy that might be 250 times the mass of the sun. Um, so that upper limit is still still kind of um, being figured out by mathematicians and observational astronomers alike. So that's uh, the limit of sizes, but there's also a limit to how bright a star can get. Um, this is called the Eddington limit. And it's basically how, how bright can a star be before it starts shedding its outer layers off into space. So basically you've got gravity keeping the star all put together, but you also have radiation and pressure from the fusion going on in the star that kind of keeps it puffed up. And if there's too much energy and too much radiation, then the star will start to lose its outer layers. And that's where we see the um, Eddington limit kind of come into effect. So this brings us nicely into talking about what happens when stars die and what objects that they leave behind. Um, so for this next portion, we'll go back to space and I will pause and see if any more questions have come in. I know there's a lot of content here to digest. Uh, so we have some um, specific questions, maybe breaking down into, my goodness, what is inside an atom and like what the, the course of those building blocks are from smallest to largest. Um, and we also have questions about stars forming. Is there one specifically you'd like to tackle? Yeah, well, I, I actually think that first question um, about what's inside of an atom is going to come in handy uh, as we talk about some of these kind of uh, objects that are left over after a star has died, um, because it really does go down all the way to the subatomic level of things. Um, so we're talking about a lot of really, really massive objects here, like stars and, you know, eventually galaxies and black holes and things like that. Um, but at the smaller end of things, um, an atom is essentially the smallest unit of matter and atoms make up everything. And inside of atoms, there are subatomic particles called electrons, neutrons, and protons. And so the uh, composition or in the number of these subatomic particles determines what element something is. So, you know, hydrogen has one proton and one electron inside of it. And so different elements have different compositions of these subatomic particles. That's on the super, super small end of things. But it will come into play as we talk about um, these dead stars. So when an average star starts to run out of fuel, when it starts to kind of near the end of its life, so a star like our sun after about you know 10 billion years, uh, it will start to shed its outer layers of gas. So it reaches that Eddington limit uh, and starts giving off more energy and having more outward pressure than gravity can uh, compensate for. So it's kind of like these two forces are in a battle. You've got gravity trying to keep the star um, intact uh, or collapsing kind of inward. And then you have pressure that's pushing it outward. So pressure with an average star eventually will win this battle and we get um, the death of an average star. So it doesn't explode or anything like that. It just kind of sheds its outer layers. And we can show an animation of what this might look like. Um, they leave behind these beautiful clouds of gas and dust called planetary nebulas. And right at the center of these nebulas is an object called a white dwarf. And so this is the remaining very hot, very dense core of the star that was once there. So submaterial gets shed out, some of it kind of collapses into the core. So if we pause like right around here, whenever we get a little bit closer there, we can talk about these objects um, because they're very, very dense. Um, so white dwarfs, the remaining 
core of a dead star generally has the mass of about our sun. So you can think of all of the material that makes up our sun squished into the size of the Earth. So these objects have incredibly high densities. And the only reason that they are being held up at all, so they're not collapsing down because of its own gravity, is actually because of particles at the subatomic scale. Um, the thing that kind of holds these objects up uh, is called electron degeneracy pressure. So basically, electrons don't want to be near each other inside of an atom. Um, and the fact that they don't want to be near each other causes them to kind of stay apart, right? So the, at the subatomic level, that force, that lack of wanting to be in the same place inside of an atom is actually keeping this entire object um, intact and you know preventing it from collapsing under its own gravity. Now, if you were to add more mass to this object, eventually it would collapse even more. It would overcome that electron degeneracy pressure and it would turn into something else. And this limit here is called the Chandra Sekar limit. It's how big a white dwarf could be without collapsing even more. So now let's bring it to the next step. Uh, let's talk about what that might look like. So incredibly massive stars, when they start to run out of fuel, they explode, they go supernova, and the core will continue to collapse in on itself. And it will bypass the Chandrasekhar limit, and it will get even more massive and more dense um, until it forms an object called a neutron star. So this is an animation of a very massive star exploding um, and kind of throwing all of its outer contents into space, speeding through uh, interstellar medium. But again, right at the core there, we have a very, very dense object left over called a neutron star. And a neutron star happens when the electrons are forced to basically squish together with protons in the, in the nucleus of an atom um, and form neutrons. And so in these objects, they are even denser and they're more massive. So neutron stars generally have the mass of maybe two times, two to three times the mass of the sun squished into the size of a small city. So something that might be like six miles across. Um, so these are incredibly dense objects. And instead of the electron degeneracy pressure keeping them you know, held up, we've got neutron degeneracy, degeneracy pressure. Um, that's keeping it, keeping it a solid object. If you were to add more mass to a neutron star, eventually, it will completely collapse in on itself and become a black hole. And so this particular limit, and I have to look at my notes for this one because it's hard to remember the name of this particular limit, but that's called the Tolbin oppenheimer volkoff limit, or the, I'm just gonna call it the TOV limit. And that's how big or how massive a neutron star can get before collapsing into a black hole. So how do black holes form? Well, they form after supernovas, but they have to be extremely massive stars that go supernova in order to form a black hole. So for that, let's go back to Worldwide Telescope and just take a look at our galaxy from the outside because we have a super massive black hole at the center of our own galaxy, at the center of the Milky Way. and it's actually keeping a lot of the galaxy together because it's so massive. So once a star goes supernova, a, a star that's big enough to create a black hole, that core will bypass the electron pressure, it'll bypass the neutron pressure, and eventually collapse into an infinitely small amount of space. And this is where we see black holes forming. And Hubble has actually done a lot, uh, has given us a lot of evidence for the existence of black holes because they've been theorized since the 1960s, but not confirmed until the 80s or so. Um, and that's all because of observational evidence. 
So black holes are really interesting because there's a whole bunch of mass in a very small amount of space, an infinitely small amount of space, but they still have a, a radius. So the radius of a black hole just means the kind of area between the, the singularity or the point of all of that stuff kind of collapsing together. And then where um, it's kind of like the point of no return. Basically, if you cross this boundary called the event horizon, um, there is no escaping a black hole. But if you're outside of that boundary and you're moving fast enough, you will not fall into a black hole. Um, so that is the event horizon. It's also known as the Schwarzschild radius of a black hole. So I'm going to stop there um, and see if any more questions have come in. Uh, we don't have any questions about those at the moment. OK, no worries. I can, uh, I'll keep talking about black holes because they're pretty cool. Um, so black holes can come in all different masses as well. You have some that are relatively small that happen after stars explode. Um, those are called stellar mass black holes, but then you can also get supermassive black holes. Um, and there's no star that could ever be big enough or massive enough to create a supermassive black hole. So astronomers think that these supermassive black holes um, are a result of smaller black holes actually colliding together and getting more massive or eating up a lot of material. So if a star or a giant cloud of gas gets too close to a black hole and gets you know, within that event horizon, that point of no return, it will fall into the black hole and that black hole will gain mass. And so it can get bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Um, until you get, you know, black holes that have millions of times the mass of our sun, like the one at the center of our galaxy, uh, which is very, very massive and is keeping a whole bunch of the galaxy together. And uh, observations from Hubble suggest that every galaxy in the universe probably has a supermassive black hole at the center um, that is responsible for the formation of the galaxy. And looking at a galaxy's supermassive black hole can tell you a lot about the galaxy itself. So things like the size and the type of galaxy, and it can tell you a little bit about the evolution of the galaxy as well. So how it's changed over time. All right, well, uh, we've kind of just gone from the uh, edges of our solar system to the edges of our galaxy, which I think is pretty good for a Tuesday afternoon. Um, so I will wrap things up there and hand it back over to you, Katie. Thank you so much, Katie. I loved that wrap up. <laughs> Thank you for taking us around uh, um, some of space today. And um, I would also like to thank all of you, all of our scientists for joining us today and asking some wonderful questions. Um, thank you also to Talia for driving us around. <laughs> um, and uh, if you're interested in checking out some of those um, telescopes for yourself, you can visit worldwidetelescope.org. And if you'd like to visit us again virtually, check out mos.org slash MOS at home. And uh, please consider supporting us if you can at engage.mos.org slash welcome. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you next time. <laughs>